This episode is sponsored by Interactive Brokers. And are you interested in bond trading? At Interactive Brokers Bond Marketplace, you can access over 1 million global bonds, including government, corporate, and municipal bonds, all in one place. With IBKR's bond search tool, finding and comparing yields against other brokers has never been easier. Streamlining your investment decisions to a level that's uh, pretty easy. Plus, you can trade U.S. Treasuries around the clock five days a week, allowing you to react to, well, market news, economic events, whenever they happen. Enjoy bond trading with no markups or built-in spreads and low transparent commissions, which can help, of course, improve your returns. Rated a top online broker, Interactive Brokers has won awards from Barron's, Investopedia, Stockbrokers.com, and has been benzing as number one overall online broker for bonds for four years in a row. The best informed investors choose Interactive Brokers, member SIPC. Visit IBKR.com slash bonds and start trading today. The Disciplined Investor is all about you, your money, and the markets. Sit back and get ready for this edition of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. This episode of The Disciplined Investor is sponsored by Horowitz & Company. If you're looking for a portfolio manager, look no further. Horowitz & Company, from seed through harvest, cultivating financial success. I'll pop it away. What's next? So many questions about the market's next leg. Inflation, mixed messages, but the Fed is pushing the carrot. Our guest this week is Dr. Richard Smith, the doctor of uncertainty. All this and much more on episode number 877 of the Disciplined Investor Podcast. And welcome to this episode. Thanks for being here. I appreciate you. And uh, I guess I got to ask, what did you do for the week? Was anything exciting? What happened with you in the markets this week? I would think that uh, if it was related to the markets, it could have been a great week for you if you've been in investing in the top 10 stocks that have been moving pretty well for a while now. Hey, it's Andrew Horowitz. I am the host of this fine show since 2007. Still going very strong and going to continue for a very long time into the future. Also co-host of DH Unplugged as well. It's myself, John C. DeVore, get together each and every week. And we talk about the things that are really moving markets, the things that are really uh, important when it comes to the news of the markets. And that we take and, and, and really look at it from a different angle than most. And we're not just yes men. We're not just looking at the stuff saying, well, this happened. Well, what we do is we actually look at it and try to understand from all angles what's happening. So make sure to listen to that. And, you know, here, what, what's great, I think, about what we do here is, is it's, it's not this theoretical. Because we're working with people just like you who are, I dare say, confused with what's going on with this market right now and, and want to know some of the best ways to allocate their investments in this very, I would say, questionable and confusing environment. That doesn't mean bad, but a lot of people have questions. And I, I was thinking about that. Um, you know, listen, we've talked about some of the basics of diversification over time. We've talked about the lobster trap mentality. We've talked about one foot in and one foot out, which has helped many of you. The flower garden, right? The whole diversification concept. And I hope, I, I really hope, that during this, you're not just listening with half an ear. And I get it. You're on your bike. You're jogging. You're doing your exercises. You're in your car on your way to work. You're trying to go to sleep. And I definitely can put some people to sleep. So you may not be listening all the time intently. But at least I hope that you're getting the opportunity to embrace some of these ideas and use it for your own benefit and for your profit. That's really what it's all about. But if you're not able to and you know, do this on your own. If you're not able to, for whatever reason, get this done, that's where we come in, right? That's that's when you bring in an advisor. And if you want to, all you do is reach out, go to thedisciplinedinvestor.com and shoot us a request. And yes, we're working in your area, so don't worry about that. It's 
these days, it doesn't matter if we're next door to you or 3,000 miles away, we can work with you, right? If you want to contact us, just go there. Anything you want to do, you know, maybe even a portfolio review. In fact, this is something I know that listeners love. I know that you love this because we've gotten so many requests over the years for this, is to, hey, Andrew, what's going on with my assets? What's going on with my investments? Well, we're here to diagnose what's going on and how to optimize those for you. And with that, I want to talk about a re really interesting conversation. I think this goes hand in hand with this discussion. I was out on uh, Friday night last week. Yeah, it was Friday. And I was going out to dinner and um, I sat down with this fine gent and his lovely wife. And before I could roll my chair in under the table, before I got to any point of even putting a napkin on my lap, he says, when is this going to end? This is ridiculous. I'm thinking, what, what's going on? I really, I don't know what's happening. Um, what, what, why is he, what, is there something happening in the restaurant? Is there something happening with the waiter? Is there something happening with, I don't understand what's going on. I, I was really confused. And, and, and I said, what the hell are you talking about? He was, he was, he was so worked up. He says, the market, the market, it's up like 30% this year. He says, and he, and he was kind of, you know, going, going off on this whole thing. He says, crazy. I said, what do you mean? And I tried to calm him down a little bit. He says, no, but you don't understand. The market is up, you know, 30%. I'm like, no, it's not. I said, the market is up, no question about that. But maybe 15% for the S&P 500, maybe 20 couple, 22% or so. Dow is not even up nearly uh, uh, in the teens at all. It's still below 10%. And I said, well, the market's not up that much, but let me ask you a question. Are you participating in any of this? Now, I knew the answer just by the way this was all going down. I, I knew what was happening. He said, of course not. No, no, no. He's been waiting two years, he said, for the markets to come down, for the correct. Think about that for a second. He's been waiting two years for the market to come down because he knew it was too high back then and it's got to come down. Whatever goes up comes down, right? Not really, but okay, that's the theory. Two years sitting on the sideline. I mean, think about how much, how much was lost during all this time and what is going to happen when what? A 10% correction all of a sudden happens? And then what? Still, we're going to be higher than one year ago. That doesn't help much because it's still higher than where he was sitting on the sideline. So what is he waiting for? I said, what are you waiting for? Like a 15 or 20% correction? He says, yeah, that would be great. I said, but... I bet that when that happens, you're going to be too scared. You're going to be like, you know what? I knew it. I knew it was too high, and it's got to still come down more. You're going to be like, I told you so. I told you so, but you're going to be too scared at the time. Let's wait. And then when the markets start turning up, you know, those green shoot moments, whether it's a, a V recovery, U recovery, a, a, a W or whatever it is, you're going to be like, oh, no, nope, this isn't real yet. There's another leg down, blah, 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 right? So why bother? Why, why, why are you getting all worked up, I said? Because you know what? To tell you the truth, you're not going to invest no matter what. What's the point of you being so distraught? This is my conversation. I said, why are you so upset about all this? Then I started thinking, how can he have a paradigm shift that will help him? And that's a lot of work because his fear is just this idea that when he invests, everything's going to come crashing down. It's going to be the top. He's going to be wiped out, which is why, by the way, we developed this whole idea of one foot in, one foot out, this strategy to getting back in, right? We've talked about this really a lot during, I guess it was post-2020 pandemic when people were freaking out, this idea of a multi-layered dollar cost averaging program over time, this way you could stick a toe in, then a foot in, and then a leg in, and you buy in over time. It's a great way to quell some of those, those crazy fears that we all have. And the truth of the matter is, I gotta, I gotta be honest, over the past many years, post these big corrections, this kind of attitude and process of looking at this as a long-term opportunity 
when things go down, not not being, you know, like, ah, I'm just going to put money in and just forget about it. No, doing it systematically, doing it in a way that that blends both time-based and opportunistically based investing, it, it works. So many clients that would have never put their money back to work over the years have done so. This is really good stuff. So now what about our current situation, right? Where do we go from here? It doesn't matter long-term because we're talking 20 years out, but let's for a moment, let's back it up. Let's reel it all back in and let's recognize that my friend that we were having dinner is probably never going to invest and that's just fine. That's just fine. Way beyond what his level of comfort is at this point. At least he could admit it to himself and stop being so upset about it and having this, this anguish and this, this, this terrible feeling all the time. So a lot of people are saying, yeah, but what, what about this, you know, the next... Two months into the election, to the end of the year, through six months, five months. So in the short term, if you're pinning me down, if you want to ask me, if you want me to go through this, markets need a bit of a rest. Everything that I've seen historically, when I see these kinds of moves that don't stop, that everybody is starting to trip over themselves, head over heel and, and want to get in, they need to rest. And even if they don't want to, we're starting to get to these extreme levels of, uh, I guess, combined risk appetite and maybe in a way complacency. We see the VIX levels that are well under long-term historical averages. And, you know, on one hand, there's a lot of excitement over the thought that the Fed is going to cut. And the fact is that the Fed is going to, it has this itch. It's not a great sign. The Fed cuts when things aren't so good. Now, we have earnings coming up, right? We saw the beginning of those on Friday with the financials, but we saw this big run up into earnings, not the best setup that you've ever seen when it comes in, the overconfidence that we're going to see blowouts across the board. And we already know that on the average, most of the time, anywhere from, I don't know, mid 70s to high 70% of companies will beat analyst estimates, even in the worst times that usually the case. They they do a really good job of prepping the analysts before they put out their, their numbers. But there is a, a feeling of overconfidence and we saw, look at what happened with the banks, right? Look at the banks, you know, whether it's Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan. Look at that before their earnings came out of how much that run-up was, was over the last, you know, three weeks. And this rallying that we've seen into earnings season, which now officially has started. So do I think this is going to be a major crash? Well, not really. Some froth needs to come off. And that will be determined pretty much by the earnings season that we're going to see very shortly. But it could be just a simple correction, 5%, 8%. We don't necessarily have to have a V recovery that everybody is hoping for and looking for, which could give us some, actually some really interesting entry points. My hope is that we have some kind of a, and we're seeing it in some areas, right? We're seeing it in, in, in consumer discretionary to a degree, um, fast casual restaurants. We're seeing it in, I'll just say consumer related, play, uh, um, I, I would say, Generally, the consumer-related stocks, everything is obviously flowing into AI technology. But this can get us into some really interesting points where it'll be uh, some good valuations. And this is why we have to be ready with our buy list, our sell list, a process. So I'm looking forward to, to be honest, uh, getting into a few areas of better valuations. But I am not going to be the guy sitting across the table from me shouting, hey, what's this going on? When, 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 when is it going to happen? How is it so crazy? Because I am going to be participating for my clients, for myself, up to a point that there's a reasonable amount of comfort aligned with risk, aligned with the long-term outlook, and then setting myself up for more opportunities. That's the game. That's the play. And that's the way we get to success. So let's get right to our guest, Dr. Richard Smith. In 2013, he founded TradeSmith, which uh, started as a simple way to track portfolios and then evolved into this powerful suite of risk management and portfolio analysis tools. And then the company grew to over 30,000 investors who entrusted his technology with an amazing 20 billion, with a B, uh, total assets, earning him the moniker of Doctor of Uncertainty inside of there. And after 16 successful years, quite a run, he sold TradeSmith at the top of the market. Uh, he's also the CEO of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. His latest endeavors also Risk Smith, and I got to tell you, we got we got let's we got, we got Trade Smith, we got Risk Smith, much better name than 
trade Horowitz and risk Horowitz. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, that is hysterical, Andrew. <laughs> I can see why you didn't go with with uh, with that theme. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Horowitz investor. No, it didn't work as well. <laughs> right. You doing well? Things are well? Yeah, doing great. Thanks. How are you doing? Yeah, everything is good down here in sunny and hot South, steamy, steamy, sunny and hot South Florida. <laughs> Can't say as I miss it. Yeah, I hear you. I love it. I love it. As a matter of fact, uh, I think uh, I enjoy... Now, there's oppressive heat and there's heat, right? There's that oppressive heat. I played pickleball 4 p.m. in the afternoons in oppressive heat. And after like Ooh. an hour, you're like, oh, I don't know. Ouch. I don't think I could do this anymore. That's you know, you're impressive. Just, yeah, you're, just, you're, just, you're literally wringing out your shorts. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. That's, that's tough. That's the kind of guy I am, you know? No, no pain, no pain. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. <laughs> All right. So there's a few things you've been working on that I wanted to talk to you about and catch up because we talked about this in the past, but I thought it'd be great really to um, have you uh, really get down and deep into some of the things. And, and again, we have Riftsmith, we have cycles.org. Um, mm -hmm. So some of the things you've been talking about, and I know that we've talked about is this, this whole idea about your average trade time and the importance of understanding a few things there. Can you kind of yeah. get us into this discussion? Yeah, well, you know, um, a lot of people have been asking, where have you been for the past year, Richard? <laughs> and uh, the truth is, I've been trading. Oh. I've been down in the weeds. And I said, look, if I'm going to share this with people, I need to really get in here and use it myself at a higher frequency. So I'm not day trading. I I'm basically um, kind of swing trading, I guess you would say. Yeah, in so the you're a swinger. Markets. Swinger, swinger, yeah. I'm a swinger. Yeah, I love it. And I've been really putting this stuff to the test. Wow. And, you know, my, uh, this is the disciplined investor. So I assume the audience has <laughs> some affinity for discipline. Yep. But Andrew, I've believed for quite a while that really the markets pay reward discipline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and that goes mm -hmm. back to something you and I have talked about a lot, which mm -hmm. is, the Nobel Prize winning research of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Richard Thaler and this idea of loss aversion, how we hate to lose. And the fact that we hate to lose makes us want to take more risk with our losers so we don't have to sell them. But the fact that we hate to lose when we're winning attaches itself to our profits. And so we don't want to lose our profits. So we become risk averse when we're losing and uh, and risk, sorry, risk seeking when we're losing and risk averse when we're winning. So upside down. It's so upside down. And then what's really twisted, Andrew, is the fact how this all connects with our hormones and dopamine. And it's like the deeper you dig the hole, the, the bigger dopamine hit you get mm. at the hope mm. of digging yourself out of that hole. It's like, oh, man. When I get out of this, it's going to feel so good. It's like this. It's like, I'll show them. I'm going right. to show and them, and then I'm going to brag this, about it. I'm smarter than the market. That leads to this incredible dopamine rush, you know? And we live in this dopamine screen-based reality today where we're really like, you know, have a business model of addiction. So anyway, all of that is to say, I've believed for quite a while that discipline has alpha in it, right? Yeah. That just by that. itself, it's got alpha. Uh, Jack Schwager, I interviewed him and I said, what do all the market wizards have in common? And well, you said, interviewed Mark. I've, uh, he's coming on my show actually. Actually, we booked him, I think, out to, I think is the the December, the last week in December show uh, for 2024. Yeah. Love Jack Schwager, yeah, right and uh, he's, you know, I, I interviewed him with, for the Foundation for the Study of Cycles, and I said, what do all the market wizards have in common? And he said, oh, nothing. They're all totally different. They have, com they're completely different, but they're all pretty religious about risk management. Yeah, <laughs> true. That's true. Like, but, and nobody seems to make the connection that maybe risk management is the key. Right, so, like so risk. Yeah, but let me you write these market wizards books, right? And yeah. they're full of all the unique strategies that everybody's doing, blah 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 blah. But it's really the risk management that they all have in common that all the market wizards have in common. So maybe there's something wizardry like about risk management. I don't know. Just saying. So, so what is the difference between risk management and risk aversion? Well, risk aversion is. Um, 
I, I guess, I mean, so risk aversion is something different than loss aversion. So just have to change gears here mentally for a second. Um, I think risk management is about being conscious about the risk that you're taking. And that's kind of what I'm driving at here. So for mm -hmm. me, what's been a real game changer, we started out talking about knowing your time frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I discovered that I couldn't sit at my desk all day long. You know, I just can't do it. So I'm not a good day trader okay, because yeah. I can't be monitoring what's going on in the markets all day long. There are times I have to leave. I don't want to be tied down to my desk 24 seven. Um, and I can't do day trading. Right. Yep. So I had to settle on, you know, then I tried 30 minute bars. I tried hour bars and finally I settled on two hour bars and two hour bars. That's my interval in the market. Like I say, I can check the markets once every two hours. I can do that. Right. So that's the level that I can trade at behaviorally for me, where in my situation, um, you know, where I'm at in my life. Right. So that was very important discovery for me because that really allowed me to kind of set some, some parameters, you know, yeah. that I could work my trading around and that I could then estimate, you know, how much pain might I have to put up with if I can't check the market for two hours. Yeah, the agony, okay. the agony of not looking. The agony of not looking, but also really <laughs> it leads into this idea that I just call it exposure, okay? Huh? But exposure is basically how much risk am I exposed to, okay? If things go against me for, say, you know, a day, mm -hmm. okay? What's my worst case scenario for a whole day? Right. And that's technically like if things go against me, by one standard deviation for 10 periods in a row. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's kind of my worst case scenario. And I got that from Ken Grant and his book, Trading Risk, uh, which is still one of my favorite books on risk management. I think he's a very like down to earth risk manager and he's done it. You know, he's got general risk advisors that he does for professional investors, but that was his rule of thumb. You know, you should be able to put up with, uh, you know, a one standard deviation move for 10 periods in a row. So I know this is getting a little technical, probably sounds complicated. It's really not that complicated, but basically now I have a number. Hey, if I'm going to, you know, work off of two hour bars, I know that, you know, this is kind of my worst case scenario over a 20 hour period. And that number is so helpful to me. Well, and by the way, they, that number is radically different. If I say, you know, I'm doing daily bars, you know, I'm going to check once a day. It totally changes things. And like it, my exposure can go up 5x. Well, but in addition to that, it takes the emotion. Well, maybe it doesn't take the emotion out of what's happening because, you know, you're losing money. Right. You, you, get, you get emotional, right? You may get emotional about that. It's not like you're. you're yeah, no, you're, it's you're, not. But what it does it is. the head but what, out it, of it. Right, right, but it also it sets the stage. Yeah, it puts it's the, very liberating. Right, it puts the parameter around. I love this because it puts the parameter around. I'm getting into this trade at. I'm just going to pick some numbers, okay? At 14, and yep. I think it's going to go up. You know, whatever. Uh, but I'm also understanding that this. You know, we're going to be able to deal with this through a move through 11 or whatever the number is. Yep, exactly. You know, whatever the number is, uh, if it gets below that, that's when we start chopping. But it's not like, oh my god. You know, it went to, uh, you know, I bought at 14 and now it's at 12 and I'm freaking out because I didn't have anything. I, I, I You know, it's the old, yep. if, 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 if you're going somewhere, if you're on Nailed a journey, it. a trip, and you don't have a map, how the hell do you know where you're going? You know, if you're a, uh, if you're a pilot in an airplane, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, the, you know, the channel that you got to be flying in. And that's really what this is for me. It's the, it's kind of the channel that I've agreed with myself, I can fly in. And so like having that target exposure is very important, you know, and a lot of people think, Andrew, oh, you know, I don't want to get overexposed. And that's true. But I find oftentimes I'm too underexposed, mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot of people, especially, you know, um, independent investors 
are often really underexposed because, you know, you get burned once touching the stove or Mm -hmm. you listen to TV and politics and you get scared and you want to go hide under a rock, you know, or you just know that you don't know what you're doing. Right. Right. Yeah. So having that knowledge and that kind of target of exposure and then managing to that has been really game changing for me. Mm. Very liberating, made me much more agile and nimble in my trading, much more able to kind of change things more easily without getting attached to one position over another. So big deal. Now I want to, I want to, let's just take a quick break here. I want to talk about this idea about time frame just for one more moment, the math. Yep. And I want to talk about something that I learned uh, many, many years ago. And, and, and when I say learned, that doesn't mean uh, fully implemented, uh, but learned. <laughs> Never uh, does, right? <laughs> right it's a about, lifelong journey. Right. About, about taking a trip to the horizon. So just hang on one second. And let me ask you an important question here. I want you to think about this. Are you looking for your next investment opportunity? Because Interactive Brokers Global Analyst Tool helps you uncover hidden opportunities in the global stock market. With its unique features like the World Data Screener, you can precisely pinpoint undervalued stocks by comparing prices and financial metrics of global stocks all in the same currency. Plus, the World Map Screener allows you to quickly find stocks that meet your specific financial criteria across the universe of global equities. Imagine the advantage of making better investment decisions with powerful tools at your fingertips. Don't miss out on your next great investment. Experience the power of IBKR Global Analyst for free today at ibkr.com slash global analyst because the best informed investors choose interactive brokers. We're back with Richard Smith and we're talking about different ideas on, on how to get your mind straight, basically. And, and, and one of the things I mentioned was this idea of if you start a journey and your goal is to hit the horizon, you're never going to get there. Mm. The horizon is a moving target. As you get closer, it gets no further away, no closer to you either. So having some kind of concrete and reasonable goals that are measurable, I'm going to, this this is going to be, this is all in the form of a question, by the way, just think about this all in the form of a question. Um, That, that these discernible and, and, and absolutely uh, clear, goals that you have or targets that you have, um, as opposed to, you know, I'm just trying to make as much money as I can. Tell me about that and how that could be impactful. Yeah. So that actually is a great point. It relates exactly to what I've been talking about, about this idea of a, a target, a specific target exposure, right? How exposed am I willing to be to the market at any one time, knowing what my time horizon is, right? Mm -hmm. And setting that and then, you know, having that as a reference point, like I got to make sure that if I want to make this much money, this is the level of exposure that I need to be at, right? And Mm -hmm. this is the level that I'm willing to, um, you know, endure. So now I've got a specific target number that I can sort of build my portfolio around during the day. And so the way I do this, Andrew, is I have a number, you know, let's say that at, on a given day, I'm willing to lose $5,000 max. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I can have five different positions on that all have, you know, a thousand dollars exposure. Okay. I could lose a thousand dollars on each of them if they all win against me. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's one way to think about it. But when you have that target exposure, okay, then you can actually start to combine your bets in a way that they actually complement each other in the exposure oh. and reduce your overall volatility. I think the technical term for this might be discounted exposure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a form of diversification. But basically, if you kind of put together a collection of uncorrelated bets, so now we, so, I can so, so, actually have $2,000 of exposure in each bet but when I combine the five of them together, it's not $10,000 of portfolio exposure. It's actually $5,000 of portfolio exposure. So if you put your bets together using, you know, in an intelligent way, one, you have your exposure target, which is a specific number. But then when you put your bets together 
and your bets are uncorrelated, you can actually reduce your exposure by half. So you can double your risk, basically, and still have that same target exposure. How do you do that? Through ETFs, through individual stocks, combination? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, you have to find a collection of assets that are uncorrelated. I use the futures markets myself. So I'm trading equities, I'm trading treasuries, I'm trading energy, I'm trading crypto. Mm -hmm. And through all those, you know, they're not perfectly uncorrelated, but I'm basically able to keep my exposure at about 50% of its full cost by trading, um, you know, roughly uncorrelated assets. Mm, that's interesting. You know, again, that, that all comes into the whole process Oh, um, yeah. it's not a single thing of just picking a stock. It's, no. Oh, goodness gracious. Right, right. That's that the is, point though, right? It's not just yeah, that it's easy. Actually, <laughs> it's not that just, just easy as picking a stock. I know. I know. And that, it's so frustrating because that's the way the world works. You and I both know that. Yeah. You, you know, somebody, you get invited to go on television and all they want to know is what stock should I buy? Yeah. You know, is the market about to top? Is it going to bottom? Yeah. You know, where are we? What's happening? And that's, that's why, you know, going back to Jack Schwager and the market wizards, you know, they were all pretty religious about risk management. Yeah, because risk management is actually what helps you to survive and you don't thrive if you don't survive. Yeah. You know, so, so that's why it's so key. So the whole point is in, in the process that you're talking about right now, the whole, the whole you know, risk smith discussion. Uh, yes. of, 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 of this, that we're this part of this conversation is understand, yep. just recapping, understanding about knowing about your time period, um, yep. how frequently you're going to look at the markets, how much you can stand it. And obviously, listen, if you're unable to get away from the markets and watch it like all the time, watch pot never boils is probably a great way to look at it, but also you're going to yeah. make a lot of mistakes. Absolutely. I can tell you, you probably kind of go crazy. I have trading accounts. I have long-term <laughs> personal, not, not to mention my client accounts. I'm telling you some personal um, items here. I have, I have short-term trading accounts and, and, and day trading accounts, and I have long-term accounts. And I got to tell you something, you know, you could have some overlap in some of that, but the truth of the matter is some of the things that you pick for the long-term without looking at them, they bother you less than the stuff on the shorter time frames. Absolutely. And that's because so much of this is between our ears, you know? Yep. Between our hairs and up our ass, to be honest with you a little bit. Just, just, I'm saying. <laughs> well, glad you said it yeah. and not me. <laughs> um, let's 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 switch it's up. Your show. To, <laughs> let's switch up to uh, to um, so, some of your work. Also, is involved in the area of cycles, and yeah. um, you you recently republished a book, a classic book by Edward Dewey on say, yes. uh, on cycles. Um, I honestly, I'm being very honest. I know nothing about this, about this book. Yeah. So can you tell me something about it? Yeah. So, um, the foundation for the study of cycles was founded in 1941 by Edward R. Dewey, who was the chief economist in the Hoover administration. And he was tasked by president Hoover to, um, figure out what happened, what caused the stock market crash and the depression. Mm -hmm. And he talked to a hundred different economists and he got a hundred different answers and he decided that something was missing in our knowledge of, of, of the economy and uh, of markets. And at this time, there was also, he got, he started to learn about uh, wildlife biology cycles and geology cycles, et cetera. And he got interested in cycles and how, um, you know, cycles manifest throughout our world in markets, in the economies, but also in geology and biology and, um, uh, you know, all kinds of different fields. So he started the foundation for the study of cycles, which was really an incredible um, organization, especially when it first started it out. I had the secretary of the Smithsonian, you know, the, the head of geology at Yale, um, the ambassador to Japan, uh, and W. Clement Stone, who was a major industrial uh, insurance uh, tycoon, who helped, who was the chairman and and uh, and was an early funder of the foundation. So all that work led to the publishing of Dewey's book, "Cycles: The Mysterious Forces That Trigger Events," in 1971. Hmm. And this book has been, you know, out of print since then. Copies used to cost two hundred and fifty dollars, um, but we worked with Harriman House to bring back this book into print. So they published it under their Harriman classic editions. 
um, along with reminiscences of a stock operator and other classics. And we're very pleased that they recognized the value of this book and wanted to republish it with us. Mm -hmm. So the basic idea is that there are cycles in our world and we need to study cycles more, understand them, look for common cycles across different phenomena and kind of integrate a knowledge of cycles into the way, into our understanding of how the world works. And that was basically Dewey's conclusion was that something's missing in our understanding of how the world works. And, uh, and for him, that was cycles. So he set out to develop a science of cycles and to, and, and that's what his book is about. So it's interesting because I mean, cycles, we also kind of put into this like pie. Do we put into this like uh spiders webs? You know what I mean? The, 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 the symmet the yeah. symmetry. Do we, do we put in right. these kinds of like things that happen, even, even astrology or alignment of planets uh, conceptually? Cause I know there's some people that yeah. look at that. Is that all part of this whole big gamut of what we discussed, what we call cycles? Well, cycles um, are simpler than that, but I think it does kind of fall into this category of patterns in time, right? So as time, as things unfold in time, there's often patterns, right? So mm -hmm. the sunflower, Fibonacci, um, Elliott wave is another set of patterns, recurring patterns in time that people study. So I think cycles kind of fall into that category of patterns in patterns that manifest over time. Um, cycles tend to be, you know, more just like kind of sine waves. And we use predominantly digital signal processing to do the cycle detection, also called Fourier analysis. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're really looking for, you know, peaks and troughs in time and price patterns in the markets, right? So uh, one of the cycles that he writes about in his book is the 42 month or uh, about 180 week cycle in, in the stock market. And that's been present all the way back to when he started testing in like the 1860s. Wait, so there's how many, a, the 42 there's months? There's a regular 42, rhythm. 42 months? 42 months, mm -hmm, 181, 180 weeks, let's say. And uh, so that's, you know, top to top or bottom to bottom. So it's about 21 months uh, from a top to a bottom and then a bottom to a top, another 21 months. Why? Don't know. You know but <laughs> don't know, don't care you know, kind of thing? In the data, you can look at it back to 1860. And if you look at just, you know, where we're at today, we've been saying for the last... 16 months that we're going to see a bull market from, you know, basically the cycles, this cycle tops in late 24, early 25. And we've been saying that, you know, all the way back to the beginning of 23, that everybody's saying that there's going to be disaster, a crash, et cetera. But the cycles say that more than likely we're going to see a bull market for the next, you know, 21 months plus or minus two months. You brought up the, uh, you, you brought it up. You said Elliott wave. And, and yeah. what, what's interesting about Elliott wave of theorists or practitioners yeah. or whatever you want to call it, um, yeah. they get, a, I don't know if they get a bad rap or they get a good rap. I'm not sure, you know, or a no correct rap because they're usually so negative. The Elliott wave guys that I've run into in the past, in, in the past yeah. are just negative Nellies always looking yep. for the crash. Yep. When in fact, and Elliott Wade doesn't necessarily only predict a crash. It's predicting both sides of a run and a run or a crash, right? Absolutely. Elliott Wave, you know, I mean, Robert Prechter, who's been the biggest advocate of Elliott Wave. And the biggest bear. Remarkably intelligent man. Yep. And he, you know, he he has really been about Elliott Wave as a social phenomena, right? So it's not just about markets. Um, it's about how you know, collections of people behave together, which is what markets are, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it can lend itself to, I mean, cycles can be the same way. People can get, because sometimes cycles can be so uh, seductively accurate. And you're like, how the heck did the cycle know that was going to happen? Dewey called it 
and the mysterious forces that trigger events. But, you know, we all want to catch a top or catch a bottom, right? We all want to mm-hmm. be like the, the um, you know, the, the brilliant uh, forecaster who nails the top to the day or nails the bottom. So that becomes a very seductive temptation, I think, when using things like cycles and Elliott waves that you want to identify these kind of counter trend moves. But I've found that to use cycles effectively, I'm not a big Elliott wave uh, practitioner. I'm interested in Elliott wave. I'd like to learn more about it. I respect it, but I haven't really studied it. But with cycles, what I do know is that I have to combine cycles with trend. I have to pay attention to trend. And then I have to know when the cycles are suggesting the trend could change. Doesn't necessarily have to change. Sometimes a cycle will just slow a trend down, you know, and, uh, but I, I understand why people kind of get seduced by cycles and Elliott wave, et cetera, because sometimes they really can seem magical. And then you well, want to be the it's, smart it's, guy it's, in the room who, you know, calls the top or the bottom. It's too easy just to grab the information off the chart that shows a four or a little C or something like that on the Elliott right. wave chart. And then the whole media landscape rewards you for saying crazy things. Right. And then you're, you're a rock star. <laughs> If you want to get on a show, just say, I know the day the market's going to top. Yeah, you know? exactly. And so did <laughs> and I could go say that now. I could go say, oh, sure. my, my chart show that the market tops on January 22nd of 2025. Yep. That's what happened and with Elaine like, Garazella. Really? Look, look at the fame that she got <laughs> during the 87 crash. Right. You know, she was one of a few, handful of people predicting it. Now, how long did they predict before that? And, and yeah. how many wrong calls after that is not going to be discussed yep. on this show. <laughs> right. You know, exactly. So I, I try to stay away from the media yeah. as much as possible. We don't get along very well. <laughs> so what, what are the, what are the cycles helping you with in terms of chart analysis? Yeah, well, I, you know, I mentioned I've been trading, I, I'm using short term cycles on two hour bars basically. So I look at cycles over like a month long period. If I look at every, if I look at the market in two hour, you know, bars, then I use the cycles detection technology of mm-hmm. the foundation for the study of cycles. I actually have a show now on YouTube called trading market cycles. So we have cycles TV, the foundation for the study of cycles on YouTube. And I'm sharing my work of how I'm integrating short term cycles into my trading strategy. So you and did I not- found it to be very powerful and very helpful. You've determined in this latest venture not yes. to use the Smith in the name of the particular item. <laughs> Cycle Smith. <laughs> I don't know. Trading, it's trading, trading. Many sisses. Yeah, trading market Smith cycles. Trading market cycles. Well, this is a uh, show of the Foundation for the Study of Cycles. Oh, there you go. So it's not really about Doctor uh, Smith. Not about Doctor Smith. Yes, I got you. Uh, so okay, so 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 you're, you're discovering a few interesting cycles. Give me give me an example of something. Just give, can you give me a little more concrete of some things that you're like, wow, that that works really well. Um, well, yeah, in gasoline, for example, there's a annual cycle and, uh, it tends to go up from, I think it's like August through, uh, well, let me, I don't want to give inaccurate information, but let me just say okay. <laughs> there's an extraordinary annual cycle in natural in, uh, in gasoline that, uh, goes up you know, through the uh, spring and into early summer and then goes down from early summer into, uh, you know, the end of through winter and uh, and back and then bottoms again in, in winter and goes up into the spring again. So that's just a simple example of a cycle that people aren't aware of, but it's extraordinarily um, uh, effective and um, uh Really, uh, hopefully profitable. Hopefully valid. profitable so, and profitable. That's yeah, the it's point. The most profitable cycle I've ever seen. Yeah. So another thing, like in Bitcoin, for example, there's a one-week cycle. It's about 120 um, uh, periods on my two-hour bars. So it's actually Bitcoin tends to go up for a week and then down for a week and then up for a week and down for a week. Mm-hmm. And I learned that through my looking at the cycles, the same 
technology that Dewey talks about in his book that uh, identified the 42 month cycle in stocks back to 19, back to the 1850s. Um, you know, we can use that same technology now, more advanced versions of that technology on much shorter time frames. Mm. And in doing that, I've been able to identify very stable, significant cycles on shorter term time frames. And one example is the basically, you know, one week up, one week down pattern in Bitcoin. Interesting. Where can people get information on, uh, I know we got cycles.org, right? Risksmith.com. Yep. yep. And, and, uh, and on YouTube, we're at uh, Cycles TV. That's it. Cycles.tv or Cycles TV on, on YouTube. Cycles TV on YouTube. On YouTube. So Cycles on TV on YouTube. And we're not talking about bicycles or motorcycles. We're talking about the cycles no. of time, the cycles of relationship between time and various assets to hopefully trade, make yeah. money. That's the whole point, right? Yep. And, you know, and, and a bigger picture of cycles too, like we've been doing research on sunspots and geomagnetic influences. This, this, is, where start, this is where you start losing me. This is where you start losing <laughs> me. But, but, but I want to hear about it. So I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to hold my tongue and I'd like you to explain both, please. So there's a lot of research going on about how the magnetic field of the earth can actually influence our hormones, serotonin in particular. And so when you have geomagnetic storms in the atmosphere from the sun's, you know, uh, interaction with the earth's magnetic field, those can actually start to influence emotions in people in, in mass. And those can be correlated with movements in the markets where people get more pessimistic um, and, and or more optimistic. Hmm. So that's just an area that starts, that shows that, you know, we're not, it's not just about looking for, you know, cycles in the markets, but we're trying to figure out what is the bigger picture of why cycles are so prominent in our world. How can we better understand them? How can we better understand ourselves? And how can we better understand, you know, our collective endeavors? What we need to do is, um, it's not pressure, it's, it's, it's gravity, you're saying, right? It's the gravity that, that affects serotonin levels? Is that it's what you're saying? It's actually the, 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 the geomagnetic field. Geomagnetic field. So it's, it's the magnetism. So I wonder if we could do a test of how the same trader go up into outer space <laughs> and trade for a month, come back, and trade for a month and see the re results. That well, would, that I would think be, it's that'd actually, be... <laughs> it's more about the collective behavior. Ah, that's a good point. Of good point. market participants. Right. So you got to watch and those sunspots. humanity in general, right? But yeah, so. my friend Tom McClellan talks about this. He gives a sunspot report every once in a while. Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, we're in a more active time for the sun. And, you know, one of the theses is that a lot of the anxiety and polarization that we're experiencing today is because of increased activity on the sun mm. interacting with the earth's magnetic field and generally making everybody a little more irritable. Mm. <laughs> well, I can attest that people are generally more irritable than they've been. But <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, I me too. I love it. Me too. Dr. Richard Smith, thanks so much for joining me today. Always, you know, by the way, the first time you were on, I don't know if you remember this, the first appearance you had on the show was in um, October 2020. Wow. Last appearance, October 2023. So we, we kind of finally got it not into October. So that's good news. <laughs> Always good to talk to you, Andrew. Thanks, Thanks so much, so much for good. having me. All right, bye-bye. You too, bye. That's going to wrap it up for this edition of the Discipline Investor Podcast episode number 877. Thank you so much for joining me this week and every week. Next week, we have some great people on. We're going to be talking about the high cost of college. We're going to have some people on, uh, guests like Howard Silverblatt, talking about the S&P 500, the earnings expectations, where it's going, what's happening, what is it doing, all that and more coming up on the next number of shows right here each and every week. Thanks for joining me again. I'll see you again real soon. Nothing discussed in this podcast should be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Past performance is no indication of future results. In addition, the information presented is not intended to be used as a sole basis of any investment decisions, nor should be construed as advice designed to meet the individual needs of any particular investor. Nothing herein constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice 
or individually tailored investment advice. Remember, investing involves substantial risk. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results and a loss of original capital may occur. No one receiving or accessing this information should make any investment decision without first consulting his or her own personal financial advisor and conducting his or her own research and due diligence, including carefully reviewing any applicable prospectuses, press releases, reports, and other public filings of the issuer of any securities being considered. Please consider this for educational purposes only. As always, use your best judgment when investing. Horowitz & Company, Inc. is registered as an investment advisor with the state of Florida and conducts business in other states where it is properly registered or is excluded from registration requirements. Registration does not imply any level of skill or training. Advertisements are not related to the host or affiliates and are not considered recommendations by the host of the show or any affiliates of Horowitz & Company.